Hey, don't mind the mess. I just got back from like a 24 hour day. I've had like two hours of sleep, but um, I, uh, a few thoughts were kind of going through my mind and uh, kind of floating around my mind about God's love. And there's just been a lot of reminders this week about God's love for me. And uh, sometimes I'll just sit in like quiet moments with him and I'll listen to his voice. I'll listen to hear the still small voice of the spirit. And uh, like even from the beginning, I there are times, several times in my life where I don't need to use words with God. Like God hears your thoughts. He knows the thoughts that you think. And sometimes uh, I find that telepathy is more effective than actual words because I can get a thought across in the blink of an eye and not have to worry about how it sounds or if I'm asking the right question. And uh, so sometimes I'll just sit in silent moments with him and I'll ask him some silent questions because like even the first couple of weeks when uh, God came into my life, uh, most of my conversations with him were nonverbal. I would just think a thought and I knew that he was he would hear it. But uh, I, I wanted to share a few thoughts about God's love in this video, about how you have his spirit on the inside of you, which has been poured out. God poured out his spirit into you because he loved you so much. And he's made you clean. God's word says, you know that verse that everyone talks about, be holy as I am holy. If the Holy Spirit is inside you, you are holy as he is holy. So you no longer have to put um, a standard on your life of holiness or trying to reach a point, like trying to reach for perfection all the days of your life, but never actually getting there but just resting in the truth that you are already made perfect. You're already washed. You're already sanctified. You are already justified in the name of Jesus by the Holy Spirit of our God. There's a verse for that. I'll put all the verses in the description too. But I only plan on really giving you one verse, but you know, God leads me to say more. <laughs> but yeah, um, I don't want to just give the, I want to share with you the thoughts that have gone through my mind over the years, especially um, how God has taught me about his love and one of the ways they taught me about his love was kind of just the uh, excitement I get from my friends and family when I see them. I get so excited sometimes just to see my favorite people or like when they walk into the room, it's just like, oh my gosh, there they are. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm so happy just to see them, just to be in their presence, just to see their face, to watch them smile, to see them enjoy the things that they enjoy. And uh, when I see my friends like enjoying their hobbies or even when I see like my family members enjoying something that they, they love, it makes me happy. Like God's word says we're made in his image. And so like the things that bring him joy, the things that bring us joy, bring him joy. So when God sees you enjoying life, when God sees you happy, when God sees you living that abundant life, enjoying every single gift that he's given you, it makes him happy. He loves you. It's just such a simple, such, such a simple truth that I feel like a lot of people don't know. Some people think that God is out to steal things from them or just always look at your life as if you're in this bondage to trying to be good or trying to live a life that's pleasing to him. Like God even said to Jesus, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And I still remember early on, like God actually, um, he gave me like a fresh insight into that verse because because all of God's word is truth. And under the new covenant, God's word says that as Jesus is, so are you in this world. So if Jesus is well pleasing to the father, then you are also well pleasing to the father. He finds great delight in you. But, um, yeah, so like I get, I get excited about just like the presence of my family members and friends, and I get excited about the things that excite them. I get happy when they are happy. And God is happy when you're happy too. But uh, not only that, but I, I really like to um, design characters and write stories for them. And sometimes I will be working on a, an art piece, whether it be like an illustration of someone or like a character design and that like I've already written their entire story. Like Psalm 139 says in your book, they all were written the day's fashion for me when as yet there are none of them. And like when I write my character stories and I see the good plans that I have for them, it brings me so much joy. And guess what? They're not even real. <laughs> they're not even real. You know what I mean? But like they're fictional. I created them. And yet like I'm just a human and I created these fictional characters that I love so much with all my heart. How? Like, how can you... How can I think for a moment that God would love me less than I love my own characters? God wants the best for you. I've said it before, but I looked up that, that word for in the verse that says, if God is for us, who can be against us? But that word for actually means hooper. It's the Greek word hooper, which means for the betterment of. So like my plans for my characters in my story, I know a lot of people write characters or stories with a lot of gruesome details. 
I want my characters to live. <laughs> and I want the best for my characters. I want the best for them because I love them. I made them. I didn't create them to die or to suffer. I created them to live and enjoy life and have a good story, an adventure, an adventure of a lifetime. So yeah, I'm just a human, an imperfect human who um, <laughs> has been given this wonderful gift of enjoying what it's like, kind of seeing into God's heart what it must have been like for him to create the world and look at it and say, it is very good. When he created mankind, he said, it is very good. God saw that it was good. He looked at his creation. And I remember hearing it. Um, I think it was Joyce Meyer who said once, I don't know if she was the first person to say it, but I once heard her say that um, she believes that when God rested on, the, on the, the Sabbath day, one of the reasons why he rested was probably to enjoy the beauty of his creation, just to sit back and think, I made this, it is good, it is beautiful, and I am so excited just to see everyone live the good plans that I have for their life. And Jesus redeemed us, like we have this abundant life. We no longer have to go back to the old covenant of trying to earn things to obtain, or try to obtain God's favor, or trying all the time to reach a point where maybe God's pleased with us, or maybe, maybe he'll give us a good life if only we're good enough. Like Jesus already redeemed us from the curse of the law. So there's no curse for us, even if we sin. That's radical. But even if you sin, there's no curse. Jesus redeemed you from the curse. So now, even people who don't have good and prim and proper lives can receive the grace from God. It is a free gift. Super cool. But yeah, there's a verse in uh, 1 John chapter 4 about God's love. Um, it is 1 John chapter 4, verse 16. It says, And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. There's even um, John 3.16. Everyone knows the verse, but I kind of want to give you some uh, a deeper meaning into the verse because a lot of people don't realize like the depth of that verse. God's word says that God so loved the world. God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And then the verse that comes after that says, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And that word condemn means to judge. And that word saved means to heal, to make whole, to deliver, to cure. God did not send his son into the, to the world to judge you or to put a standard on your life. That was under the old covenant. And God's word says that he found fault with the old covenant. That's why a new one was sought. Jesus established a new covenant on better promises, his blood, which has just justified us. So now God treats us as if we've never sinned. God will not bring a curse on you if there is sin in your life. If you failed in some way, if you're imperfect, you qualify for God's grace because where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. Your sin, your imperfection, that wrong word you said, if you got into a fight with a friend or if you're having an altercation with a family member, if you did something wrong, that sin cannot taint God's grace for you. God's grace. I think I even, I saw like a TikTok where um, a guy poured this dark liquid into a bottle. I think Jesus is like the vinegar. It was some sort of a cleansing liquid. But he poured that liquid into a bottle and it got rid of all the darkness. And then even when he poured more darkness in, it still was neutralized, like, what's the word? Uh, it was washed away, but <laughs> whatever detergent was in the other liquid. Jesus' blood has made your sins white as snow. Though your sins were like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they were as scarlet, they shall be as wool. So under this new covenant, your sins are as white as snow. The more you know this, the less you're going to be occupied with your sin, the less you're going to struggle with your sin because you know you are clean. You are wearing Jesus' garment. You are clothed with a garment of his righteousness. So enjoy that. You are right with God and you are beautiful. You are clothed in his linen. So yeah, God loves you. He has good plans for your life to prosper you, to give you, um, oh, what, what's that verse? Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah 29, 11. Plans to keep you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. God has good plans for your life. He loves you so much. So he loves you more than you love. Cut off. All I was going to say is God loves you more than you love yourself. Also, which reminded me, he enjoys your company. If I can experience that joy of exp um, just spending time with my best friend or spending time with my family and the joy that I get just from being in my the presence of my family, God finds immense joy in being in your presence too. And just you hanging out with him, you talking with him, telling him like your dreams and all the things that you like or just spending time with him. You don't have to have like the right words. Like you don't always have to go to him 
because you feel motivated to pray about something, you can just literally hang out. It doesn't have to be like brought on by, like you can go to him for all the time, whenever you want, wherever you want. But I, I wanna give a, a verse from the Song of Solomon. And um, I'm probably not the first person to share this, but I remember hearing it preached once. And I wanna kind of rewind to the verse because I've never heard that, that verse preached before. Um, I, with some insight about God's heart and uh, how he sees you, like how the bride groom, how the bridegroom sees his bride. Because if you read Song of Solomon, you can read it for, uh, I guess, or, um, inspiration for like, romance or like marriage or like your romantic life. But I, um, I've heard it preached before in, in the, how I word it, kind of in light of who Jesus is and who his bride is. Like we're the bride of Christ. We are, the church is his bride. So when you read Song of Solomon, you can also read it, seeing Jesus as the groom, like the husband, and then you as the bride. Personally, I've never been in a romantic relationship, but <laughs> being married to Christ is pretty awesome. There's even a verse that says that we've become dead to the law because we've, been, we've died to what we were held by, so we should serve in the newness of the spirit and not the oldness of the letter. So we're no longer under the standards of the old covenant law. We are, we are in the newness of the spirit, and God's word says the spirit gives life. His spirit that's inside of you gives life to you. And, um, that verse says that we're married to Christ, that we should bear fruit. Because you are married to Christ, you will see his fruits in your life, all the fruits of his spirit. You are married to him. You're no longer married to the law. It's like a, I once heard it described as like the law is a, a cruel husband who is absolutely perfect. Like he's unbendingly perfect, but he's so perfect that he can't even come down to your level. God's law cannot stoop to our level. But Jesus did. Jesus came down to where we were. Like, I just think of the leper. Um, he came down the mountain. He came down the mountain to where the leper was. He came down to our level. So, yeah, it's super cool. Um, but yeah, he came down to your level, and he, being married to him is way better than being married to the law. Under the law, you had to keep all these rules, all these regulations. You had to follow God's law to a T. And if you were not perfect, you be cursed. I know I've said it before. I'm not the first person to share that. And I'm certainly not the last. Like God's word is amazing. There's such a contrast between law and grace. Under the old covenant, you literally had to be perfect. Some people think that you need to try to keep God's law to the best of your ability, but you cannot. If you try, if you go down that road of trying to keep God's law to the best of your ability, you will inevitably find out that you cannot even keep God's law. And there's even a verse where the apostle Paul was struggling with law. He says, the more I try to keep God's law, the more I can't. <laughs> and there's even, a, there's even a verse that says, the law entered that the offense might abound. God's law entered that the offense might abound. Literally, if I could put it in simple words, God's law came in to show us that we can't keep it. God's law entered to show us how perfect God's standards are, how unreachable God's standards are. But there's also another verse that says, what the law could not do, Christ did. God sent Jesus in the likeness of sinful flesh. He condemned all of our sin in his flesh. And now that righteous requirement is revealed in us. It is, what's the, oh, how does the verse go? It says, fulfilled in us. It's not by us. So it's not your work. It's not your performance. It's not your trying to keep the law. His life, his spirit gives that life. That law of the new life of Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Super cool. But yeah, um, the verse in so uh, Song of Solomon. Um, and as I read this, I want you to see Jesus as the bridegroom. I think I, that's the, the, the husband, right? The bridegroom. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not familiar with like romantic terms, but when I see Jesus as the husband, we get to be his wife and we get to be married to him and enjoy that fellowship. Like I said, never been in a romantic relationship before. Being married to Jesus is pretty awesome because he treats you right. Son of Solomon, chapter two. I'm going to start in uh, verse 10. My beloved spoke and said to me, the bride speaking, I think. My beloved spoke and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. <laughs> Already, my heart's kind of pumping because this is super romantic. My beloved spoke and said to me, rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. For lo, the winter is past. The rain is over and gone. The rain is over and gone. So like that dark and depressing season, that's over and gone. You're free in Christ. The flowers appear on the earth. The time is, of singing has come. And the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. 
And that just kind of struck a chord in me, just you'll cut off again. There's a verse in God's word that says, challenge me in this, um, challenge me in this as if I will not pour out upon you such a blessing that you will not be able to contain it. So I've seen that in my photos. I have so many memories. I need to get rid of all my extra photos so that I can make more room for all the videos that I record. It's like a recurring issue. I'll eventually I'll get more storage, but continuation of what was being shared. So I'm reading the Son of Solomon. And when I got to the part that says, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land, that struck a chord to me. And I looked up the meaning of the turtle dove in the Bible, and it's a picture of innocence. It says the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. And God's word says that uh, he's made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter which kills, but the spirit. And like the whole new covenant is all about righteousness by faith, the turtle dove, innocence, the voice of the turtle dove, the voice of innocence, the voice of justification. We are innocent through Jesus Christ. Pretty cool. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. <laughs> that was just kind of new to me. I never really saw that before. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. I'll share that too. But um, yeah, I'm probably not the first person to share that. I don't know if anyone has shared that before, but I just found it exciting. But yeah, the fig tree puts forth her 20% better. The fig tree puts forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. He's so romantic. <laughs> Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. And Jesus, imagine Jesus is speaking to you. Oh, my dove, in the clefts of the rock, in the secret places of the cliff, let me see your face. Let me hear your voice, for your voice is sweet and your face is lovely. I don't know about you, but I just fall, I'm falling more and more in love with him. Just the more I see his heart, the more I see how the depth of the thoughts that he thinks toward you, the depths of the intimacy that he wants with you, just to go through life with you, to take every step and explore everything, to see your face and to hear your voice. He doesn't just want your, like he doesn't want performance. He's not about performance. Performance is important. Like obviously living a godly life is important, but Jesus wants you. He wants your company. He loves you. He made you. He wants intimacy with you. Super cool. You have intimacy with him too. The voice of the turtle love is heard in our land. You are innocent in Christ. So yeah, I hope that refreshed you. Jesus is awesome. He's the greatest lover. And his love, I, I, th I think of, I'm kind of going on and on, but I think of just human love. I've experienced a lot of human love in my life. I've experienced friends and family who have loved me immensely. And I've experienced wonderful things of just like wonderful hugs shared or even like something as simple as a high five with a best friend or like a, a special handshake or just things that make life wonderful when it comes to family life or friendship. And it's beautiful, yet it just cannot compare to the love that God has for me. I've never experienced a love like his. And even when it comes to, um, even when it comes to, even when it comes to experiencing human love, if I could say this in a million ways, it doesn't compare to Jesus' love because he loves me perfectly and he sees me perfectly innocent and his opinion of me doesn't change based on how good I am or how pleasing I am. His opinion of me is always good. He always sees me clothed in his garment of salvation. So, and that's how he sees you too. It's wonderful. He sees you perfect and he's the same yesterday, today and forever. Therefore, God sees you the same way yesterday today and forever. He's not going to look at you one way one day and then see you in a completely different light another day. He sees you always clothed in his righteousness. So it cannot be said enough. God loves you. Jesus loves you. He's the greatest romantic ever to exist. He's awesome. Peace.